This is Jarvis DeBerry with NOLA.com. I'm sitting here today with Ashley Howard of Loyola University. Ashley Howard received her PhD in history from the University of Illinois. Her research interests include African Americans in the Midwest, the intersection between race, class, and gender, and the global history of racial violence. In her dissertation, Prairie Fires, Urban Rebellions as Black Working Class Politics in Three Midwestern Cities. Dr. Howard argues that an individual's position within class, gender, and racial hierarchies directly influence uprising participation. She is currently expanding her dissertation into a book manuscript. Dr. Howard, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. You know, I saw an interview that you did um, I've seen a couple of interviews that you've done. Actually, I noticed that you don't like to use the word riots, that you have tended to use either rebellions or uprisings. Can you explain your choice of words in that matter? Absolutely. So riots is oftentimes has been used as a pejorative term. It used that people just going out into the street wantonly engaging in violence, usually property violence, with no rhyme or reason. By using the term rebellion or uprising in lieu of riots, that shows that there's deeper issues involved. There are grievances that people have. There are actual things that they can point to that they're upset about beyond just going out and having this kind of carnivalesque opportunity to destroy property and perhaps loot. So are there such a thing as riots at all? Do, do black people ever riot? Do, you know, do people in America ever riot? Or is it always linked to something? Sure. I mean, and I think what I would claim as a riot perhaps would be um, after the head coach, the football head coach at Penn State uh, was fired. And I think, you know, people went out in the street, they're rocking cars, they're showing, they're setting small fires. And this was, they're upset, and so they're reacting to something like that. But it's not that they've been disenfranchised from other venues of protest and to engage. And so for me, that very much seems like a sport, a sports riot or a thing. So, sure, if an African American was a part of that group, they could, of course, riot. But historically, not only for black Americans, but for people across the globe, these kind of violent uprisings are tied to large larger political and social issues. Uh, in an interview that you did, no, it was not an interview, it was a piece that you wrote in The Black Scholar. Mm. Uh, you criticized the mayor of Ferguson uh, after Michael Brown was killed because he was making a distinction between those people who were gathered peacefully praying and those people who were out on the streets destroying property. And you said uh, that there weren't two separate kinds of protests, but interrelated tactics on a protest continuum. Mm -hmm. Explain what you mean by that. Do you think that there is some kind of unity between those people who are, you know, uh, I don't want to use the word rioting, but destroying property uh -huh. and peacefully marching? And do they know that they are unified one with the other? I, I think that's a, a great question. I don't think they know that they may be unified. I, I don't think there's a certain type of strategic understanding that you do this and we're going to do this and we both uh, get to the same end goals. In fact, I think people are very much engaging in certain types of protests based on how they feel that they can affect change in their communities. For people who have had positive experiences with the police, who believe in the legal process, who may have some sort of access to social or political capital, they may engage in these kind of nonviolent direct actions that become so uh, a part of our memories in terms of the civil rights struggle. But for people who are constantly marginalized, constantly ignored, this can be a very powerful mechanism to have their grievances held. And I think oftentimes when we talk about um, political protests, and particularly for African Americans, this false binary is created between Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. But at the end of the day, they were still looking to have the same goals. It's just their assessment of America, of the political climate, led to two very different tactics. And I argue that they're on the same political continuum because they are both trying to achieve the same goals. They're not, they don't have two different missions. And oftentimes what we've seen historically happen is that the this violence, or oftentimes the threat of violence, makes the more traditional types of protests more palatable and more willing to be accepted by the power structure. I've seen Ossie Davis uh, in a long ago interview 
talk about that friction, that tension between Malcolm X and Martin Luther King and how the power structures initially rejected Martin Luther King, mm -hmm. but the threat of Malcolm X. So there is this other brother out there, right. as Ossie Davis put it, and I don't think you're going to like him all that much. Absolutely. And I and I think, in, you know, with Ferguson and Baltimore, the conversation certainly has changed. But after the initial non-judgment um, for Zimmerman in the Trayvon Martin case, there is this specter of rebellion. What happens if they do not... Um, Convict. They do not convict him. What will happen? Are they going to go, they, right? Are they going to go out in the street? And so the specter of rebellion, the specter of violence has been a very powerful tool um, in the arsenal of African Americans. Even looking back to A. Philip Randolph in the first March on Washington, the thought of hundreds of thousands of African Americans marching on Washington, even if peacefully, was terrifying. And so this notion of good and bad representation becomes this kind of through line in protest history in these communities of who can do this. And now that we've actually seen these uprisings occur, I think that makes it a little bit more real and a, it's quite scary for some people. You know, I think most people can cite you know, Los Angeles in 1965 or Los Angeles in 1992 or, you know, Ferguson in 2014 and Baltimore in 2015, but that may be the extent of their knowledge of these types of events. But it's a more extensive history than that, is it? Can you give Certainly. us kind of a, a summary, maybe just resist easy <laughs> <laughs> summary, but how often this has happened in American history? Yeah, well, and first I, I kind of want to go a little broader than that in saying that working class violent rebellion has been a part of at least Western history well into the 1700s, 1800s. Thinking of bread riots that occurred there, thinking of working class uprisings that occurred. So this type of violent protest has been omnipresent for people who do not have access to traditional means of protest. And not just black people. And not just black people. Um, in the United States, you see collective violence occurring most early in the uh, World War I, World War II era. So there were interracial conflicts, which would be blacks and whites fighting together or fighting against one another. And we see this in St. Louis, East St. Louis in 1917, Chicago 1919. And then we see a shift in the 40s. And so 40, 1943 was a particularly bloody year. We see an interracial conflict that happened in Detroit, an interracial conflict that happened in Houston. But then we see what we commonly understand as urban rebellions or riots today in Harlem. And this was African Americans upset about an, an incident of police brutality going out and destroying property. And so this is kind of the first shift in these types of uprisings. We begin to see a critical mass of these take place in the early 1960s, the first of which occurred in 1964, actually, in Rochester, uh, New York, and Patterson, New Jersey. And then with 1965, with Watts, this was kind of the first really large-scale explosion. And then from 66 and 67, you see this take place in about 300 different cities throughout the United States. And what people find so kind of startling when you dig deep into this is people begin to think that these are only large city problems. Places like Los Angeles, places like Detroit, places like New York. But in fact, the majority of these uprisings took place in small, mid-sized cities and in the Midwest. Hmm. And so places like Peoria, Illinois, Omaha, Nebraska, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, all experienced uprisings that took place. And then the final kind of um, number of uprisings that took place were in 1968 after King's assassination, of which the costliest took place in Chicago. And so that's kind of been the history of this type of violent rebellion in the United States. Have they ever happened and the larger public says, oh, I understand why they're doing that? Or yeah. is there always the resistance that they shouldn't be doing this or have no yeah. legitimate grievance? Yeah, surprisingly enough, there is actually quite a great deal of empathy with the ones that took place in the 1960s. Of course, you see a lot of the same kind of discursive um, writing off that you see today. Why are they destroying their own neighborhoods? You know, if they got jobs and they worked hard, they wouldn't face these types of things. 
But I think perhaps the greatest document of understanding came from the Kerner Commission that was published in 1968 only a week before King's assassination. And this was an official government report commissioned by Lyndon Baines Johnson that wanted to seek out why the cities were exploding. And in this extensive report, they noted that America is two separate countries, one white, one black, forever separate and unequal. And that this chasm between these two groups of people was marked and that the rebellions were a response to that. So this is coming from the federal level. Uh, and that, I think, is a very, very powerful statement to inequality in this nation that often gets forgotten and misremembered as the uprisings just being, again, a social aberrant violence and not tied to deeply rooted um, protests and problems in the community. Do they accomplish anything, or is that the wrong question to ask about? Yeah, from what they yeah. accomplish. I don't think it's the wrong question to ask. I don't think it should be the first line of defense. But at least in the case of the 1960s, they accomplished a lot. And the, what needs to be noted, however, is that it's the principle of diminishing returns. So each subsequent uprising in a city gets fewer and fewer concessions. So in the case of Omaha, Nebraska, after their first uprising in 1966, they received job programming, the summer uh, camps for school, uh, police brutality training, sensitivity training uh, for the police to get rid of brutality. So these are all things that happen. But by the time of the final rebellion in 1969, the city is not interested in negotiating any longer. They just want to um, tamp it down. In the case of these recent uprisings uh, that we want to talk about, and I think it's important to note that there were smaller scale rebellions in Staten Island, smaller scale in Oscar Grant's, uh, after Oscar Grant's death in Oakland. There's been some in Benton Harbor. There's been one in Cincinnati. And so they haven't largely disappeared. But what I think the larger discussion about police brutality and these seemingly um, quite brutal murders of African Americans by police, this has put a part of a larger protest vocabulary for people, of which rebellions are being read as a viable option. And I think that has a very powerful benefit in many cases because these large-scale uprisings bring it to people's attention much louder than a small protest or sit-in or something like that. So I think that has a very difficult but real benefit to it. I've seen you in another interview say that you don't think that Baltimore is going to be the last of, of these types of events. Uh, is there any way to prevent another Baltimore, another Ferguson uh -huh. from happening, or is that the wrong question? Should we be focusing on how to prevent police brutality instead? I, I, I mean, I don't think they're discreet. I think they are very much tied together. Police brutality is a hugely pressing issue in the African American community, but it is not the only issue. I think one great example of this is coming out of it. There is a young man who took a traffic cone to beat out police windows. His bail was set at $500,000. The driver of the car that is now implicated in the death of Freddie Gray, his bail is set at $350,000. And so that is just another example of this inequity. And you think about all of the kind of systemic issues that still plague African Americans. I do not think that we have seen the last of these types of uprisings only because people are now becoming increasingly more conscious of it. And it's, I don't want to use the term contagion, but they see that this brings light to an issue in their community in not only a national sense, but an international sense. And people are beginning to understand their struggles in a conversation with broader international struggles. You know. Ethiopian Jews in Israel were protesting against police brutality just this week. And so it becomes this larger narrative of rights for people who are on the margins of society. How are you dealing with this particular topic in the classroom and what are, what are your students saying about it? In many ways, this has been a very difficult topic for my students because this has been kind of the first time when they've seen something that challenges how they understand the world. Um, in terms of what it means to be black in America, what it means to be an ally of African Americans, and trying to really negotiate this spot, oftentimes in direct opposition to what their parents and you know, elders think.
So that has been lots of really good programming around Ferguson and Loyola that we had in November. Uh, they had a die-in uh, for Mike Brown in December. And for me personally, I just this semester taught two classes that I think really spoke to this moment. One is violence in black America and kind of looking at the long history of violence in black communities and thinking about the ways that this both makes and unmakes black reality. And then also a comparative social movement course where we look really critically at how social movements begin, sustain themselves, and become successful. And kind of read the theory and read these on to larger movements such as anti-apartheid, Indian independence, and the civil rights movement. And think strategically of how to have a long-term plan beyond just a couple of nights in the street to agitate around issues of equality and to end police brutality. Okay, we could talk forever, but I think that's going to have to be it for us. But I thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. This has been Ashley Howard of Loyola University talking about the recent unrest in Baltimore and Ferguson and other places across the country. We thank you for joining us. This is Jarvis DeBerry with NOLA.com. Thank you.